Well, hello there. This is uh, Craig Hain talking, or Dr. Dell, as my students call me. And this video today is about complex numbers. And it is really aimed at people who are interested in teaching mathematics to high school students. And that would be private schools, or public schools, or home schools, or for that matter, it could be a student who wants to teach him or herself mathematics. Uh, I am assuming that uh, the viewer of this video does understand pre-calculus mathematics because we teach the complex numbers to our students at the pretty much the end of our pre-calculus mathematics uh, tier 4 course. We use the book uh, Dr. George Simmons Pre-Calculus Mathematics in a Nutshell and if you know everything that's in this book or most everything that's in it then you certainly are going to be prepared for uh, understanding this video and I might add that uh, in particular you need to understand some trigonometry to understand this video. Now the question is uh, that comes to mind is what are complex numbers uh, good for? Uh, why would one even want to teach them to high school students? And there are many answers to that but the first answer is that complex numbers are extremely important in science and technology and engineering. And so we are preparing our high school students through the first uh, six tiers to go on into the subjects. Uh, the next tier will be calculus. And uh, so they need to have that uh, as they move forward into these more advanced subjects. Now, complex numbers, it turns out, are really not very difficult to understand at all if they're uh, taught properly. And we believe in teaching students in a tiered way, as you know, so we believe that you should introduce complex numbers to the students early on. Uh, the, it's not good, I think, to introduce complex numbers uh, when you're getting ready to use them for something like Laplace transform and now the students are kind of seeing them for the first time. So we cover them in tier four and of course uh, it all starts then with real numbers. We've uh, obviously taught the students about real numbers in pre-calculus mathematics and we do that in a heuristic way. We, th we just tell them real numbers are numbers that correspond to points on the real number line. We teach them the rules of real numbers and how to do calculations with real numbers and that's how we treat real numbers. We don't try to take a more theoretical axiomatic approach. Well it is kind of axiomatic but we don't try to uh, do the advanced treatments for real numbers in pre-calculus math. Now, one of the mysteries of, um, that comes up in the treatment of real numbers, I might just add, is when you define the product of two negative numbers to be a positive number. And very often that is a confusion to students and sometimes to teachers too. And there are reasons one can give for it, but they're not the greatest reasons in the world. Um, so we often just say, well, it's a definition and that's how you make the rules of arithmetic work when you extend them to negative numbers. And that's kind of an adequate definition, but um, not a very satisfactory one. And you'll find out when we do complex numbers, then we're going to come up with a very, very good uh, reason why that is the definition that we give, or why that turns out to be true. Uh, now, one of the things that uh, we run into in pre-calculus math when we're solving uh, quadratic equations, for example, whose graphs are parabolas, is that uh, sometimes there are not any solutions in terms of roots to those equations. Uh, anytime the discriminant b squared minus 4ac is negative, since you have to take the square root of it to find the roots, uh, there is no root because the square root of a negative number of course is not defined as a real number. And so right away we've run into situations in pre-calculus where we are up against a brick wall. Uh, in fact if the parabola curves up and doesn't uh, cross the x-axis then that'll be the situation we'll be in. There'll be no real roots and the only possible roots are complex and of course we don't know what that is yet. Historically our ancestors were actually trying to solve other types of algebraic equations, in particular cubic equations, and they came across things like the square root of minus 121 I've read. And they had no idea what to do about it, uh, but yet it worked and they so they went ahead and used it even though they didn't understand what it could possibly mean and it ended up in the final analysis it would drop out of their equations but it was in the meantime it was there and they wondered what could it be. Now uh, one of the things we can do today kind of motivationally speaking is say well let's take the simplest quadratic equation we know where we can't find a real root and uh, x squared plus 1 equals 0 would be that 
and if you just try to solve that you end up with the square root of minus 1 or negative the square root of minus 1 in either case that's not a real number and so we say well we're gonna just call it a number we're gonna make up a name we're just gonna pretend it's a number we're gonna call it I and I stands the word imaginary because our ancestors kind of thought these were somehow not valid numbers they call them imaginary numbers and uh, our ancestors struggled for many 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 uh, centuries actually with this dilemma but it turns out that that is not necessary and finally they figured out a way to approach it and here is what they did here is what complex numbers now are uh, in today's definition uh, we start out with the a number line we'll call it the real number line just like we've already talked about and, but we're embedded in a plane now and we take a vertical line through this number line and we also mark it off with a similar scale only now we use a letters to denote these uh, markings uh, the first marking up is I then we go to 2i 3i we go down we go to minus i minus 2i and we call this vertical axis uh, the imaginary axis now that's a horrible name I think that's something we've inherited historically we call this the real axis we call this the imaginary axis now it's really not imaginary I mean it's just as real as this is it's um, it's, a, it's a physical axis it's in the plane and the points on this vertical line are just as good as the points on the horizontal line just as good as any points in the plane and as a matter of fact uh, that's just nomenclature we have to live with because of historical reasons but now what we do is we define a complex number to be some point in this plane and we define it in the following way suppose you take a complex number now we've learned from analytical geometry that if you project down you'll get a number on the x-axis we'll call that a and if you project over to the vertical axis we'll call that bi and we're going to call this complex number then a plus bi where the a represents this distance out on the horizontal the so-called real axis and the vertical uh, distance is on the so-called imaginary axis so and you could just use the ordered pair a comma b but now we're wanting to make this into more like a number and this plus sign indicates some type of addition is going on and indeed we'll explain what that is in just a second because if you're going to have a number system you need to have your operations that uh, you're going to conduct usually they're, we're talking about now addition and multiplication so the way we define addition of two complex numbers and we do this uh, really in a sense in order to make all the rules of arithmetic work is we take a plus bi that's one complex number and we st and we add it to a second one c plus di and we say okay now the way we're going to do that is we have a, have a new complex number and there has to be a real part which is called a and an imaginary part which is called bi so we're going to take the two real parts a and c and add them together get a plus c that's going to be the real part and then we're going to take the two imaginary parts bi and di and add them together and get b plus d i notice in all this notation a and b are always understood to be real numbers and so then bi is this is is understood to be the corresponding imaginary number of length b in any event we've done this and this is the definition of complex addition and there's a nice geometric representation of it if you take a plus bi this complex number C plus di is this one if you draw of lines from the origin to these two complex numbers then if you complete a parallelogram which is what you would do if these were vectors and you're doing vector addition this point up here then is the sum it's a plus C it's its real part B plus di is its vertical or its imaginary part I prefer to think of a as the horizontal part B is the vertical part but we can say real and imaginary or horizontal and vertical either way so that is then a nice geometric interpretation of the addition of complex numbers and now we give the students a lot of problems to work so that they can go through and do this the first thing we do is we give them points in the plane and make them point out what are the actual complex numbers where are they for example if I gave them minus 2 plus I I expect them to go over and find here's minus 2 here's I and there's the complex number uh, minus 2 plus I and we give them a whole lot of problems like that then we give them points in the plane and make them write down the complex number if I gave you a certain point in the plane I say okay what is the complex number and they would figure that out and then we give them addition problems and they do that now once we've done that and this by the way this would all take one or two lessons to get to this point 
Then we say now we need to multiply complex numbers. Well, we want the rules of, uh, the, of arithmetic that we have for real numbers to work, so we just take two complex numbers and we formally multiply them according to the rules of arithmetic with the following proviso. Uh, the whole reason we set up complex numbers was to deal with this problem of what is uh, i squared or the square root of minus 1, and so we define, by definition, i squared is equal to minus 1. We just make that a definition. I squared is minus 1, and that way we can solve that one equation we talked about. Now, having said that, if you're going to make the rules of multiplication work, uh, you just follow your nose and do grind through the thing, and you're going to get AC. Then you're going to get BI times DI. Now, BI times DI will be BD times I squared. I squared is minus 1, so that'll be minus BD. So the real part of the product is going to be AC minus BD. If you didn't understand it, pause the tape, go back, rewind it, think about it, and make sure you understand that. And, of course, this should be, for most of you, just a review. What is the imaginary part of the product? Well, we're going to take A times D, I, B times C, I, factor out the I, and you got AD plus BI. That's the imaginary part. So when you take these two complex numbers and multiply them, here's so-called real part, here's so-called imaginary part. And that is the algebraic definition. Of, comp of complex multiplication. Now, of course we give the students some problems to work. The question is can you come up with a geometric definition that's equivalent to the algebraic definition, like we did for addition. We have a geometric definition and we have a algebraic definition and they are equivalent. Well the answer to that is yes. And that is indeed what we do then uh, in the next step in what we do. And you, you, may, you probably do this too, but um, this certainly uh, is an important next step. If you have a complex number, A plus BI, it has a certain length, distance from the origin, I'll call L. And it makes an angle with the uh, real axis that I'll call theta, always moving in the counterclockwise direction. And start at the real axis and go up to that straight line that would be the ray emanating from the origin to the complex number. So this is called theta. This height is B, and this distance out here is A. And so now A plus BI is one way to express the complex number, but I could also tell you what it was if I just told you L and I told you theta. That's all you need to know. And why is that? Well, if you knew A and B, then you can find theta. Why is that? If you know a little trigonometry, the tangent of theta is b divided by a, and so theta is the inverse tangent of b divided by a. The length, by the Pythagorean theorem, is just the square root of a squared plus b squared. So if you know a plus bi, you know these two, uh, theta and l. Well, what if you want to go the other way? What if you know theta and l? Well, if you know theta and L, you have to use a little trigonometry now. You're given L, you're given theta, but you don't know A and B. Well, you do and you don't. A is this distance here, B is this distance. Now, with a little trigonometry, B over L is the sine of theta. So that means B is L times sine theta. And similarly, A is going to be L times cosine theta. So this complex number can be expressed as L cosine theta plus L times I sine theta. So I just factored out the L. It's cosine theta plus I sine theta. And so now that lets you go the other way. So now you have two ways of expressing the uh, complex number. You have sort of the geometric way of expressing it, which is the L and the angle theta, and you have the algebraic way. Now, the reason that's important is because that's going to lead us to the geometric definition of multiplication. And here's how that works. Suppose you take a complex number, and this is L1 and theta1. So this is the complex number right out here, L1 and theta1. And then you take a second complex number, L2 and theta2. Now, what's their product? And I'm going to tell you geometrically the definition. You take L1 and L2, and you multiply them together, and then you take an angle that is theta1 plus theta2, this angle right here. Theta 1 plus theta 2. And go out L1, L2. And that is the product right there. 
and that's the definition of the product, the geometric definition. So you've got the algebraic definition and you've got the geometric definition. And are they the same, of course? Now I call this the most important equation in mathematics because it has profound, profound implications in uh, how complex numbers behave and what you can do with them. And everything kind of comes back to this basic geometric versus algebraic definition and how they're equivalent. The proof of this is very easy if you know trigonometry. Uh, L1, L2 is a length, and then that's theta1, theta2. And I want to show that's the same as L1 times L2. And then, uh, well, uh, L1, L2 with angle theta1, theta2 can be expressed as L1, L2 cosine of theta1 plus theta2 plus I sine of theta1 plus theta2. That's the definition. Now, I want to know that's the same as taking this complex number, L1, theta1, multiply it algebraically times this one. Well, to do that, I have to multiply these two out. And when I multiply these two out, what do I get? I get cosine theta 1, cosine theta 2, minus sine theta 1, sine theta 2. That's the real part. That's, and we know from trigonometry, that's cosine of theta 1 plus theta 2. This is the identity. This equals this. And then to get the imaginary part, I've got cosine theta 1 times sine of theta 2. I got plus sine of theta 1 times cosine of theta 2, all times i. And that should be equal to sine of theta 1 plus theta 2. And that's an identity. So this is the proof, if you will. Now, I did it. I, I didn't write this down step, 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 step. I'm assuming you kind of understand this. And you should write down the proof. If this wasn't completely clear to you, you should write down the proof step by step by step and convince yourself that these definitions are equivalent because you're going to have to teach it to your students and you want to be sure you really understand it. Now, those identities, of course, are trig identities. And in, in the pre-calculus book, we cover them. And as a matter of fact, as I recall, they're near the end of the book. And the book's not very long. It's only 120 pages long. On page 111, we get the proof for the cosine of the sum of two angles. And on the next page, it's the proof for the sine of the sum of two angles. And so, this proof really boils down to uh, these two trig identities, which is one of the reasons trig identities are so important. Now, having said that, it's a wonderful mnemonic device. I have a hard time remembering these formulas, these identities. So what I do, if I try to remember the identity, I know that this is true. I know the geometric and the algebraic definitions are equivalent. And so what I do is I just take these two complex numbers, and I multiply them in my head, and I go, oh, I know this has got to be cosine of theta 1 plus theta 2, and this has got to be sine of theta 1 plus theta 2. So I just do these in my head. So it's a mnemonic device, once you know it's true. And uh, I always like mnemonic devices because I'm very bad at remembering formulas, and this way I now know the, uh, the formulas for the cosine of the sum of two angles and the sine. And from things you're about to learn, as we move forward, most trig identities can be derived very, very quickly and easily from facts about complex numbers. And so I don't have to worry about remembering them. I can just go and derive them almost instantaneously from things I know about complex numbers. And that's what we encourage the students to do, by the way. Now, with that definition, the equivalent of the geometric and the algebraic definition, uh, we're in a position to do some interesting things now. You might recall that uh, when we started out and we did the algebraic definition of complex numbers, we just had to assume that I squared uh, equals minus 1. That was a definition back then. But now we've defined the uh, multiplication. So now let's give a derivation of that same thing with what we know about multiplication. And here's how we're going to do that. Now take the complex number I, and I ask you, what is the angle up to that vertical line? Well, it's 90 degrees or pi over 2. So the complex number i can be denoted by length 1, angle pi over 2. Now, what is i times i? i squared, i times i. Well, it's 1 times angle pi over 2 times 1, angle pi over 2. And what did we say that was? 1 times 1 is 1. Pi over 2 plus pi over 2 is pi. So this is the answer, 1 angle pi. But what is that? Well, come down here and look. Angle pi brings you over to here, a distance 1. You're at minus 1. So i squared equals minus 1, and we've now derived that 
from this fact about complex multiplication. Do a similar thing with y is minus 1 times minus 1 equal to 1. Well, minus 1 is 1 angle pi. It's times 1 angle pi. 1 times 1 is 1. Angle pi plus pi is 2 pi. 2 pi is the same as 0 radians. And so this is what number? 1 angle 0 is just the number 1. And this then is the proof, if you want to call it, that two negative numbers multiplied together give you a positive number. And it also, then, you can derive that a positive times a negative is a negative. You've got a positive number is a real number A, has angle 0. A negative number is a real is negative, but it has angle pi. You multiply them, the, the quantities is AB, but if you take 0 plus pi, you get pi, and so that's a negative AB. And that is the, if you want to call it, the, uh, the proof uh, or at least a demonstration of why those were the correct definitions in the first place. We now have a geometric interpretation of the product of negative of two negative numbers, a geometric interpretation, because we've embedded now the real numbers in the complex plane, and we're taking now the facts we know about complex multiplication. So don't you see your understanding even of real numbers is increasing greatly because of your understanding of complex numbers. I've gone over that pretty fast, and if you don't know complex numbers very well, you'll probably need to think about that for a while. If you know complex numbers, then you already knew this, and hopefully you have been teaching that to your students. And now I want to show you something that I think is really, really quite interesting, and this may very well be new to you, uh, but it is something that I think is very important for a variety of reasons to introduce at this uh, pre-calculus level in Tier 4. And I think when I finish that you'll see why I believe that, and hopefully you will agree with me. Now let me remind you that uh, we're going to start with a unit circle. And so if we take a complex number on the unit circle, it'll have length 1 and angle theta from the uh, real axis. This is the so-called real axis. This is a so-called imaginary. Horizontal and vertical is probably a better name. And, of course, we know that's the same as cosine theta plus I sine theta. So this is kind of the one way of representing it. This is another way of representing it. Now, I am going to define E to the I theta to equal cosine theta plus I sine theta. So that's another way now of expressing this up here. This is now called E to the I theta. Now... If you've never seen this, and this is the first time you've seen it, it ought to really kind of hit you between the eyes. It's like, what is this guy doing? Is he crazy? How can he possibly do something like this? Is this, is this, is this magic? Is it flim-flam? What is it? Um, the great, great physicist Richard Feynman was reputed to have once said that he thought this was the most beautiful equation in mathematics. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but it certainly is a remarkable thing. And it has tremendous implications, as you're about to see. But first of all, what, what, what can it mean? Well, first of all, let me remind you, if you've forgotten, that e to the x is a real-valued function. This is the so-called exponential function. And here's its graph. It, uh, it passes through 1, and it rises rapidly, and it comes down here. And if you take its inverse function, you get the natural logarithm. The natural logarithm is the inverse function, so this is reflected in the 45-degree line. And all of this, of course, we talk about in pre-calculus math. Now, the exponential function has so many, many applications um, in, uh, in the world. It's in the world of finance, in biology, in... Um, just in about, well, just in all sorts of areas. And so we use the spreadsheets uh, to do a lot with this so th because it, it, there would be a lot of calculations. And we use a log scale. I might remind you that if you use a logarithm scale, then the exponential curve becomes a straight line if this is a log scale. And Raymond Kurzweil, who wrote a book called The Singularity is Near, which I like a lot, uh, used this over and over to make projections about future growth. Uh, because so much of the things that happen in life that we observe are really exponential in nature. And on most time scales, an exponential curve goes along and it looks like it's almost nothing and then it spikes. And that's because of the nature of it. Um, in calculus, we're going to learn that the rate of change of the exponential is itself. 
this is the only function that is its own derivative. And that means that the larger it gets, the faster it's climbing. The rate's going up. So if this e to the x is a million, then that means its, its rate of change is a million. And uh, that's why it spikes so rapidly. And, of course, that's why no exponential growth of any kind can go on forever. It has to saturate out. And when it does, that can mean all sorts of things, <laughs> sometimes very bad things. Uh, so exponential growth is very, very important. And that's where this e to the x comes from. Now, I'm going to show you in a minute why this definition makes sense, how we motivate it. There's a way to motivate this definition to kind of justify what we did. But first, I want to show you what we can do with this definition. And students get a big kick out of this, um, and I would hope you would too. I think that um, mathematics is supposed to be fun, and it's supposed to be revelatory, and it's neat to learn new things that you didn't know. And so let me show you uh, a couple of things here that I think are kind of neat. Uh, first of all, let's just ask ourselves uh, with this exponential form, what is the number i? Well, what's this angle from the real axis up to the vertical axis. The That's pi over 2. So this is e to the pi over 2i. That was definition, right? e to the i theta, e to the pi over 2i. Now, we also already knew that it was cosine of pi over 2 plus i sine of pi over 2. And, of course, cosine of pi over 2 is 0, sine of pi over 2 is 1. So that's, again, kind of a an indicator of why that is true. If you took a 45-degree angle, this would be e to the pi over 4 times i. What about minus 1? Well, this angle over to minus 1 is pi, so minus 1 is e to the pi i. Now, one of the rules of exponents, and it's going to apply always, is e to the n1 raised to the n2 power is e to the n1 times n2. That's one of the laws of exponents that we're going to use a lot. And I remind you, and so if we're going to use this notation, that law has to hold. Otherwise, we would not be justified in using the notation. And it does hold. So here is uh, something you might find interesting. Uh, let's take minus 1 squared, and what is that? Well, minus 1 is e to the pi i, so that's e to the pi i squared. Now, according to this, that brings the 2 inside, and that's e to the 2 pi i. Well, what is e to the 2 pi i? Well, where is 2 pi? Come around here. It's right back here. So that's 1. So minus 1 squared equals 1. Once again, that's sort of a different kind of a verification that minus 1 squared equals 1. What about i squared? Well, i is e to the pi over 2 times i, and you square it. Bring the 2 in, and that makes 2 pi over 2, which is pi. So this is e to the pi i. What is e to the pi i? Well, that's minus 1. So i squared equals minus 1. Another verification using this definition of exponential. Now I'm going to show you something that you probably have not seen before, uh, or you wouldn't know how to do. What if I ask you what is i to the i power? Square root of minus 1 raised to the square root of minus 1 power. And, 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 and if you've never seen any of this, you might even ask yourself, what could this possibly mean? What is i to the i? What does it mean? Well, here's what it means. i is e to the pi over 2i, and then you're raising that to the i power. Bring the i inside, and you've got pi over 2 times i squared, which is minus pi over 2. So you got e to the minus pi over 2. And that is a real number. So i raised to the i power is actually a real number. You can actually use your calculator now to prove it. And in fact, uh, that's what I naturally we teach the students to do, is you take pi, what is it? Uh, minus pi over 2. So you take pi, so you can get this, pi divide by 2 equals, i got to make it negative, and then i got to raise e to that power, and there it is, 0.2079. So that is the i to the i. And as a matter of fact, you may recall, if you read my book on teaching math, I had some symbols at the bottom, um, and I, one of them was square root of minus 1, raised to the square root of minus 1 power well, is 0.2079. I put that in there kind of as a clue as to what might be inside the book. And in fact, there's, a, there's interlude videos in here that talk about that. Uh, this, of course, is Archimedes' tombstone. And this is my one-question test to find out if people will learn anything from my Practical Math Foundation. I give them the triangle 3, 4, 6, and I say, what's its area? It's 5.33. 5, 5 and if they can figure that out in less than five minutes and get that answer, then they probably uh, won't get too much out of it. They'll know, they know a lot of practical math. So that's a tough problem. Now, there's other things that, uh, that we cover and, and teach the, the students. Um, 
take e to the i theta raised to the n power, and that, of course, is e to the i n theta. And so another way to write that then, e to the i theta is cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. That's raised to the n power. And that would equal then cosine of n theta plus i sine of n theta. And this is the so-called Euler equation, which is a, a great fascinating thing to beginning students. There's other ways to prove it than this. I suspect this is how Euler discovered it, though, because Euler knew a lot about the, all the things we're talking about here. Euler was a great, fabulous mathematician, and he had wonderful insights. And in fact, if you get Euler's works and read them, they're very instructional. They're Obviously, they were written in the 1700s, but he really laid the basis for a lot of modern math, the way it's uh, calculus and engineering. And Euler used something called infinitesimals in all of his arguments, which made them um, seem strange to modern mathematicians because in, an infinitesimal is a number that is not zero, but it's smaller than any regular number. Now, mathematicians, starting with Archimedes and Newton and Leibniz and throughout history, have used infinitesimals in their arguments about calculus and things related to that. But in the 1800s, when mathematicians made mathematics rigorous and they began to prove everything, they couldn't find a way to make infinitesimals rigorous. They could not find a way to include them in their formal uh, number system. So in the 1800s, uh, about 150 years ago, they banned infinitesimals, and mathematicians were not allowed to use them, even though physicists and engineers went ahead and used them, because they're very useful, extremely useful. And then it turns out in the 1960s, uh, infinitesimals got reinstated into mathematics. Uh, they found a way to handle them rigorously, and so now infinitesimals are in again. So they were out for about 100 years. I'd say it's about the 1860s when they got banned, and now they're back in. And, of course, uh, we ought to rewrite all of our calculus books accordingly, but we're not doing so naturally. Uh, when I teach calculus, however, in tier uh, 5, I use infinitesimals freely because they're, first of all, it's, rigor it's as rigorous as anything else you can do at that level, and it's much easier to do than anything else. I can actually give my students a much more rigorous treatment of calculus with infinitesimals than I can without them. And that, again, goes back to Euler. So Euler's works are very interesting. And now the question becomes, uh, I told you when we first did this, where did this thing come from? Um, who and who thought this up? I mean, when Richard Feynman saw it, 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 it impressed him. I must say I don't remember when I first saw that equation. I know when I first saw it, I had no I thought, what the heck is that? What could that mean? What, what what kind of nonsense is this? I mean, is this just something, some arbitrary thing somebody's conjured up? I mean, what's the justification? Because if you're going to use e to the i theta, all the exponential rules have to hold, or, or you shouldn't be using it. And so where did it come from? Well, here's where it came from. And in fact, one of the reasons that I love to do this in the Tier 4 is I, it's a motivation somewhat then for more things we're going to do in Tier 5 when we get into calculus. Here's something you do in calculus. In calculus, you, of course, study the exponential function with x being a real variable now, it's a real number, and you find a way to express it as an infinite polynomial. Uh, it's called a power series, but you can think of it as a polynomial that goes on forever. And here it is. e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial, x fourth over 4 factorial, and on and on and on. And that goes on forever. Now, for any x, you can always uh, evaluate e to the x with this polynomial if you go far enough out. You just have to go far enough out that n factorial dominates x to the n. And you can do that no matter what x is. Of course, the bigger x is, the further out you got to go, but you can still do it. So it's a very good a way to evaluate e to the x. In fact, I suspect that essentially that's what's behind what you do with calculators when you do e to the x. If I put in uh, 5 and I take e to the x, uh, instantly it gives me 148.4. Well, it did that in a hurry. How did it do that? It probably evaluated a polynomial or something like that. Now, sine of x has its own polynomial or power series. Uh, it's odd powers. You've got x, x cubed, x fifth, x seventh. You've got denominators are 1 factorial, 3 factorial, 5 factorial, the same as the power. But now you're alternating signs. And this is proven in calculus, very easily proven. It's called power, uh, Taylor power expansion or Maclaurin expansion. And cosine has a similar thing, only now you're using even powers. 0, 2, 4, 6. You still got the factorial and the denominator of the exponent. And again, it's alternating. So here you have the three power series representations of sine, cosine, and e to the x. Now, 
sine and cosine are already used in uh, with complex numbers. We know that. Um, e to the i. Th we know that uh, complex number um, with angle theta is uh, cosine theta plus i sine theta. If this is angle, if this is length one, we knew that already. So here's what we do. I'm sure this is what Euler did. You plug and chug. You take and come up to e to the x and say, okay, I know that's supposed to be a real number. What if I put in i theta? It's a complex number. Put it in and multiply it out. Everywhere there's an x, I got i theta now. Now I have to go back and remember something about i. Uh, I, uh, remember, uh, if you square it, you get minus 1. If you take i cubed, you get minus i, because that would be i times i squared, so that's minus i. i to the fourth gets you back to plus 1. And then you start over again. i to the fifth is i, i to the sixth is minus 1, i to the seventh is minus i, and uh, i to the eighth is 1, and then you start over again. So cyclical behavior here. And so if you if you separate these out, you take all of the even terms, and you take the fact that um, i squared is minus 1, and i to the 4th is plus 1, and i to the 6th is minus 1, and i to the 8th is plus 1, you get this series. And that is just nothing more than the cosine of theta. Just put in theta up here, and that's what it is. Now you come back to this series, and you take the odd numbered terms. And so you're going to get theta to the 1, cubed, 5, 7. Uh, I cubed is going to be minus uh, I. Uh, I to the fifth is going to be uh, plus I. I factored out the I now. And so you get alternating terms again. And this just becomes the sine of theta. So this is I sine of theta. I went over that really fast. Uh, you really need to do it on your own. There's no shortcut. It uh, doesn't matter. You can read it in a book. You can watch me do it. You should do it from scratch. I've given you the idea. I've told you what to do. Uh, just plug in I theta here. Uh, do, follow your nose and do the obvious math, and it'll spit out this formula. And so this is the motivation of it. This is where it comes from. And indeed, what happens is whenever you have a power series, a real power series, you can always, almost always expand it and put in complex numbers. And so if you've got an X here, you can let it be any complex number you want. And very often then, similar properties will hold. And indeed, you're going to have E to the Z1 raised to the z2 equals e to the z2 z1 times z2. And same, the same rules that apply in real will apply in complex numbers. So that's where this comes from. And uh, I think it's a great motivation for kids as to why they might want to then study calculus to see where did these infinite polynomials come from, these power series. And indeed, they come right out of differential calculus. Now, one last thing that I do uh, with my students because it's fun and it's useful and it has applications uh, is the roots of unity. Uh, x cubed minus 1. Uh, what are its uh, roots? Well, we know 1 is a root, and then we know that there's two complex roots. And we can do that with a quadratic equation. And it turns out we can, we can demonstrate that they are uh, these two complex numbers where these are all equal angles. So this would be 2 pi over 3, round to here. This would be 4 pi over 3, and this, of course, then is... 2 pi. We can do a similar thing where any n, you can take the you can take the circle and divide it a unit circle and divide it into n equal angles, and each one of those complex numbers then is an nth root of unity. So there's n distinct roots of unity for this. They're called roots of unity because um, I should have been a minus sign there because um, you raise it to the nth power and you get one. And so that is what, uh, that's something we do. And we, and we give them a lot of problems to play with and do that. It's a, in fact, I start off, I challenge them uh, to find the roots of unity before I tell them how to do it. I, I give them this problem fairly early in a game when they don't have any clue how to do it. And let them play with it. Let them struggle with it for a while. So I might introduce this, you know, several lessons earlier before they're ready to do it. I do that all the time in my math. I'll give them a problem to do that they're not ready to do yet. They don't have the equipment to do it. And I'll let them struggle with it. Uh, I once gave my son this when he was in the eighth grade. I want him to find the fifth root of unity. I challenged him to find the fifth root, five roots of unity, if he could. And and he struggled with it for a long time. And then I'd give him hints, and then I'd give him hints, and I'd let him through the thing. And finally, he got it because he finally got to this point. Um, but that was um, the kind of thing that's good to do. Now, it also is a motivator for calculus, as I said. Uh, differential integral calculus are extremely important. We teach those in tiers 
Uh, five is in, is, um, is calculus, and then six is differential equation. Calculus is in tier five. And then the question always comes up, well, if you got derivatives and integrals, can you extend them from real numbers to complex numbers? And, of course, the answer is absolutely yes, and it is wonderful to do that. You get into what is called complex analysis. They don't call it complex calculus. They call it complex analysis. Usually it's not taught until second, third, four, you know, second or third year in an engineering school or in a mathematics uh, curriculum. But they need to get, I think, introduced to it much earlier. So we actually define the derivative and the integral and over the complex plane and show them some of the basic facts about it. Now, first of all, it's very useful. And second of all, it's very motivational. And it's a lot of fun. And it gets them really ready. So if a kid's going to go off to MIT, for example, I want them to be ready to take their complex analysis and their differential equations and really jump into the math they're going to need for engineering. Now, I don't want them to have to fiddle around with calculus, and certainly not pre-calculus. And I don't want them to struggle with complex numbers. I want them to be really ready to do that. One of the things we're going to study in differential equations, and we'll, we'll do that in a little bit in tier six, is the Laplace transform. That is a tool that is used to solve certain types of differential equations. And I think the kids need to be told about that early on so that it doesn't come as a shock. Now, as I've mentioned to you in past videos, we have four more tiers, seven through ten. They're really aimed at mathematics students that want to become future mathematicians. And in those tiers, we do more, much more advanced stuff. And in Tier 7, in fact, we then talk about the number systems in a more rigorous way. How do you actually create these number systems and build one from the other? You start with natural numbers, with pianos, axioms, then you go to integers, then you go to rationals, then you go to reals, then you go to hyperreals. That's where infinitesimals are. That was done in the 1960s. And, but we should do that now. We do that in Tier 7, and that gives them a deeper insight. Then, of course, we add complex numbers into that mix. Well, that's been a lot of material for you on this video. I hope that it has um, inspired you, perhaps, to do more with complex numbers with your students if you're not doing already all this with them. Uh, it certainly would let you know what I do with them. Uh, if you found this um, confusing, let's say, or you felt that uh, you needed a lot more detail, then you might want to actually enroll in my Tier 4 course. Uh, where we go through pre-calculus uh, math at a more advanced level and include this in Tier 4 complex numbers. So this is what I wanted to tell you about complex numbers. This is Dr. Dell. I hope I see you on a future video. Bye-bye.